Today's video is brought to you by our friends over at Manscaped.com, the global men's lifestyle brand that has the right tools for you. But today's video is for the dads. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Manscaped is trusted by over 8 million men worldwide for their trimmers, hygiene formulations, and of course, those <laughs> premium boxers. Now, of course, if you're looking for the perfect gift for Father's Day, look no further than Manscaped. Ladies and gentlemen, they've got the, no, not this trimmer. We're not gonna talk about balls and dads together. In fact, we're gonna talk about beard hedgers. The beard hedger trimmer is a great gift for any dad who loves tech and new gadgets. It's got a 7200 RPM motor and titanium coated T-blades to cut through the thickest of hair in a single stroke. It's also got a rotary wheel so you can actually get 20 different hair cutting lengths. So no messy drawers full of all the attachments you need for your, for your beard gadgetry. You've also got a Weed Whacker 2.0 for all the dads who start showing a little bit too much forestry going on in the ears and nose. It's got a 7,000 RPM motor with the 360 degree rotary dual blade system so your dads can whack all their weeds. And if you're wondering, Muda, it also doesn't have skin safe technology. You bet the engineers put skin safe technology so you can reduce all those nicks and cuts, especially in the most sensitive nether regions. And you know, on all these products, it's got wireless charging, so your dad's gonna freak out of the magic of technology. It's also got a tri battery level, meaning that you'll know just how much charge you have left. And if you wanna give your dad both, get the Performance Package 4.0, which comes with Crop Preserver and Crop Reviver, and also comes with two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag and the Manscaped Boxer Briefs. The Shed is a premium leather travel bag that's water resistant, durable, and features a grab and go handle. And the Boxer Briefs have a microfiber blend to keep things cool down you know where. That's like gifts on top of gifts. So don't wait, go to manscaped.com today and get 20% off plus free international shipping when you use promo code SOG at checkout. That's 20% off plus free international shipping with promo code SOG. Have dads join the 8 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped and have the right tools for those family jewels. Hello guys and gals, me Mudahar, and welcome back to another episode of Haunted Gaming. Today we're covering a creepypasta known as Star Citizen. Yes, will this game ever release? Ladies and gentlemen, today I wanted to do a little dive into a game that I have been waiting for for quite a long time. Ladies and gentlemen, Star Citizen is a game that I'm sure every single one of you have heard. And, you know, a, a few years ago I uploaded a video on my channel, pretty much an off-the-cuff stream segment, where I kind of crapped on Star Citizen incredibly. And the reality is, I'm a bit jaded from this game's development. Now, in recent months, I've come back to Star Citizen, played it, and uh, part of me maybe has developed Stockholm Syndrome because I've kind of enjoyed my time. But the more and more I look into this game's development, the more and more it hurts. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Star Citizen is a space simulator exclusively for the PC that is beyond just a space simulator. It is, in fact, an ability for you to create a new life and live amongst the stars. I guess the best way to describe Star Citizen for a lot of people coming in is this game is effectively life, okay? It's not just your average MMO where you get into a few character classes, some gameplay loops, raid a few dungeons. No, this game is meant to replace life itself. You see, Star Citizen is best understood as a game where you can be a space delivery driver, okay? A space Amazon delivery agent. And the reality is there's plenty of other games like Star Citizen that give that niche. Games like Elite Dangerous. I guess one of the best ways to describe Star Citizen is like any other MMO, you would typically expect it to have character classes, your average gameplay loop. Imagine Imagine playing something like Elite Dangerous, for instance, right? You're delivering things, packages through space. You're a space Amazon delivery agent, right? Well, in Elite Dangerous, you buy a ship, you click through a few menus, and you transfer cargo onto your ship, and you go on your merry way. With Star Citizen, you pick up a contract, you go to a location, you move every goddamn box individually into your ship, you make sure your ship is ready to fly off and your cargo doesn't go anywhere, you fly to the other area, you put the boxes into your, uh, into a box at your destination that probably doesn't work. You basically got to do every single aspect yourself. I wish I could show you more footage actually uh, beyond uh, trying to get into my plane because I couldn't even access the menu to fix my plane. At one point I couldn't even access the doorways and the game consistently gave me a server crash, uh, 30,000 whatever. I guess the server must have been overwhelmed with all... You know what? Let's just move on.
The best way to describe the immersion of Star Citizen is if the game told you to take a leak, it literally wants you to find the bathroom yourself, go to the bathroom, unzip your pants through an interactive prompt, aim and piss, and then zip your pants up and call it a day. Other games would just make you press an interact button. No, 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 no. Star Citizen makes you go above and beyond. This is life after all, ladies and gentlemen. Now, of course, with all of that said, I want to take you on to the beginning. Now, you can find plenty of developmental roadmaps throughout history that'll give you an absolute perfect description of how Star Citizen's development has gone for the last 10 years. But I wanted to apply a personal touch in my video and kind of look at this from the perspective of somebody that's been here since the Kickstarter. I've fallen off, I've come back, fallen off the wagon, and I've come back. Okay, this is a train wreck that I continuously monitor until I hope to see it actually release. So to start off with, Star Citizen launched its actual Kickstarter campaign, a crowdfunding campaign. Yes, Star Citizen is actually the best example of a crowdfunded project because it has made the most crowdfunding money that I've ever seen. Now, Star Citizen also has investors from what I understand, but this is a game that has made half a billion dollars. Yes, half a billion plus in just crowdfunding dollars, okay? Making it arguably the most successful crowdfunded project ever made. So here's the initial pitch over here, which is around $500,000. That's what they were asking for initially. They ended up getting $2.1 million and around 34,300 backers. Now this was actually updated last April 6, 2013. So this is a long, long time ago, a decade ago, if you will, too, last updated. The pitch video is insane too. It's like, they thought I was dead. They said console was the future. And obviously you've got Chris Roberts and CGI Glory over here basically talking about Star Citizen, the game. Now, Chris Roberts is a central figure to the development. He is the designer of games like Wing Commander, which are games that are a little bit too old for me, but they had an all-star studded cast, absolutely great space dogfighting simulators. But of course, Chris Roberts was also one of the designers for one of my favorite games ever made, Freelancer, a game that allowed you to effectively create a character, not create a character, but play the role of a pilot, be part of an expansive campaign, and fly all over the stars, trade, fight, hunt bounties, do whatever you wanted. Compared to games nowadays, Freelancer is quite simple, but the gameplay loop is still engaging. Freelancer was supposed to have a sequel called Freelancer 2, where uh, I believe it was supposed to release on the PC and Xbox 360, but it never got made, it got canceled. And uh, even though it got canceled, to this day, it still has some of the coolest nebula cloud technology I've ever seen in any space simulator. It's a shame it'll never be released, and it's a shame that I haven't seen other games do similar tech. But at the same time, Freelancer is a far simplified project as compared to Star Citizen. If you have never played F Freelancer, if you never played Wing Commander, I highly do recommend you give them a try. If you play those games and you realize the quality of those experiences, you can understand why people gave millions of dollars to Chris Roberts in this Kickstarter pitch. So even looking into it, uh, of course now this is like CG work, but Chris Roberts wanted to effectively use CryEngine, uh, which at the time was one of the prettiest looking game engines, and I believe Unreal 4 wasn't even available at this time. Chris took one of the prettier engines at the time and wanted to make a expansive space simulator out of it. This would bite him on the ass, but we're not there yet. So even in this footage, which is one of the reasons why I think it worked so well, is he actually did show, from what I understand, some actual gameplay. So here you can see that they had a character scratching their ass, looking around one of the largest hangars that I've seen in a while, and impressively detailed for 2013. Of course, you could even see ships kind of flying around too, so obviously people were like, yeah, this guy knows what he's doing. He's a veteran in the industry. Let's, uh, let's throw some money. So real quick, Star Citizen is a rich universe focused on epic space adventure, trading, dogfighting in first person. That's all true, by the way. That's pretty much what the game intends to be. Single player, offline or online. As of now, not true. The game is an MMO, Persistent Universe. Uh, persistent Universe, that's true, hosted by us. Moddable multiplayer. We don't have any moddable multiplayer, okay? This is a persistent MMO. No subscriptions. That's true. There are no subs. 
for the game. No pay to win, arguably not true. And we're gonna get to their luxury ships really quick. So of course, pretty much after this, they had a bunch of stretch goals. So basically for 2 million, 2.5, 3 million, so on and so forth, they were going crazy adding extra goals, extra ships, extra gameplay features. And from here, you can kind of see that as the funding increased, the feature creep also showcased, which when game development is a thing, feature creep is a bad, bad thing to have. Feature creep is effectively the idea of, hey, uh, we have a core game concept we want to make, but if we have time, let's add this extra feature to it. The problem with it is, unless you just keep adding modules and features and you don't complete the core actual game, the game is going to be perpetually in development and nothing is going to get finished. You gotta make sure you have a solid foundation before you start branching off. But hey, I'm not a game developer, I'm just a guy on the internet, what do I know? So basically after this Kickstarter came out the Hangar module, and the Hangar module is effectively only for the backers and allowed people to actually go into a hangar, of course, and see some of the ships that they purchased. Now, I wasn't in this at the time because I couldn't really afford the Kickstarter back then, and so I didn't really do it. I didn't jump into it, I wish I did, because I would have liked to see the Hangar module, but unfortunately, never happened. But of course, when I had a little bit of money, a little bit of money in my pocket, I bought the cheapest game package at the time. The $45, uh, I believe it was the Mustang Alpha Bundle, which allowed me to access the Wing Commander, not the Wing Commander, the Arena Commander game type, which actually, at the time, had a tutorial section which isn't even accessible in the game anymore. So you can see right over here that back in the day, and this is a 2015 video that we're actually watching, uh, you could actually walk around in here, get a little bit of training and actually access your ship and fly around and get some basic flight information. From what I understand, this isn't available. You pretty much have to rely on figuring out how to fly the ship yourself. The game does have a tutorial mode, but we'll get to all of that in a little bit. So of course, at this moment in time, I kind of fell off the game again because they didn't really have the persistent universe. They didn't really have much of the gameplay that we see today. Now, of course, it wasn't until years later that they introduced something known as the PU, the Persistent Universe, and some actual planets you could fly and land into. Unfortunately, the game was still very buggy, the frame rate was still bad, and uh, for the few hours I played, I dabbled in and I backed the hell out immediately. I wanted to wait until the game was actually a bit more playable uh, before putting hours of my life into it. Honestly, if anything, that was a bit more off-putting for me, and that, that's one of the reasons why I just had this on-and-off relationship with Star Citizen. Six years ago, they actually produced a video where they showcased, during CitizenCon, their actual conventions, uh, the Sandworm. Now, this is a very popular clip that a lot of people have watched if you were in the Star Citizen community, where basically they were they were actually like driving this uh, ATV around, and you can actually see a dust storm in the in the distance over there. I have never noticed the dust storm and the electrical like storms going on ever in the actual game. But of course, by the time you actually get to the end, there's a moment you get off, you bring out weapons, you can actually explore a fair bit. But the most interesting part of this situation was the sandworm. So get ready, get prepared, because things are about to get a little wild. So as they explore this entire section and they start to leave the area, you can see that these ships that, you know, Chris Roberts and, and, and Cloud Imperium games are pushing look very, very detailed. In fact, the environments look detailed compared to other space games. It really does have that sense of scale that you don't see replicated in a lot of other big, massive games. Something like this in like No Man's Sky would have been like a tiny joke. In Star Citizen, it is literally one-to-one -one scale. So of course, at this moment over here, ladies and gentlemen, the sandworm is going to show up. So no joke, this is something you're about to see, whereas you see these people flying around, this massive sandworm comes up, and this, this I honestly wanted to be in the game for the longest time. I, I, I told myself I was going to play this game when the sandworm gets brought in. There is no sandworm in the game as far as I've ever seen, okay? In fact, the running joke in the community is, can't wait until this comes out, my grandchildren will understand the hype. Truly, my great-grandchildren will get it. I'm actually like really, I'm actually just keeping it real. I'm keeping it a buck 50 with you. I don't think this is gonna be out for a while, if ever. Now, if we go back to the amount of funding that this game is making, I again, wasn't joking when I said this made over half a billion dollars. Because if you go to Robert Space Industry, the site, and actually when it comes to uh, accountability and it comes to transparency in the game development, 
Nobody can say that Robert Space Industries isn't actually going out of their way to show you that they're actually working on a game. So they'll tell you the funding they make. 582 billion US dollars, okay? Now if you look at their hourly stats, yeah, they even give you the hourly breakdown. Per hour, on average, it seems, for the last couple days, or, well, for the for literally tonight, they were making to the tune of over $27,445, okay? Every day, it seems like these guys are making some days $1.3 million, some days $979,000, $1.5 million, $1.1 million per month. They're pulling in $7.9 million, $23 million, okay, in one specific month. Ladies and gentlemen, you might be like, well, god damn, how are they actually getting that much money? Well, I'm going to show you exactly how things go. Thankfully, there is actually an event going on, the Invictus Launch Week 2953, because everything in this goddamn game has to be so in-universe. So, of course, let's look at what's going on. Well, you can buy ships from Drake Interplanetary. These are kind of companies in the world of uh, Star Citizen. Yeah, they've got the lore locked down, okay? They've got company names, characters, so on and so forth. And if you actually look into their ship right now, how much do you think the average ship costs? Well, the Buccaneer, which is a rough and tumble frontline scrapper from Drake Interplanetary, costs $110 USD. What was that? What's that? Oh, no, no, that, that's actually the price right there. But you could fly it today for free because there's an event and a free play moment right now. But of course, there's more vehicles. You can get the Caterpillar, haul anywhere at commercial volume. Yeah, do you want to be an Amazon logistics freight officer in space? Yeah, $330 right now. And you might be like, whoa, Moodoo, that's just the ship value. No, 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 go to the offer page right now. You can upgrade to $330, all right? That's, that's just how Mafia works. Don't worry, dude, sometimes it gets cheaper, okay? Like the Corsair, which seeks uncharted to $250. This is actually what I have for $100. Yeah, actually like cheaped out, okay? This is the cheapest... Uh, ship that I own, the only ship that I own, I spent $100. There are games that come out with, l like, deluxe editions that are worth less than this one ship that I bought, okay? But hey, we all make dumb financial decisions, don't we? But no, you can buy the Cutlass Blue, which is bad news for the bad guys and bad news for your wallet, $175. And then, of course, you've got the Cutlass Red, which is $135. That's a space ambulance. You want to be a space medic? Want to be a space EMT? Q queue up $135. Then, of course, for $40, you can get those spacey TVs that we saw a while back. Takes open-air excitement to the extreme. Now, you can get the Herald for $85. Now, I want you to, like, get ready for this one. Get, get prepared. How much do you think the Kraken, which is the self-sustaining flying fortress, is going to cost? 200, 300, 400, five, 1,650 dollars US, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, we're getting to this point. Oh, don't worry guys, you can get the Kraken Privateer for two grand. Two grand, you're saying? Muda, that can't be real. Well, that's what they've said the ship value is. Now, ladies and gentlemen, like a lot of ships in this game, th those still aren't even the average expensive ones. There's ships more expensive than what I have shown you. And some of those ships are actually rare, meaning only a limited amount of them get made. Yes, I would say Star Citizen is kind of responsible for a lot of ills of modern AAA gaming. Yeah, these are the guys that do digital scarcity with actual digital goods. Now, I personally, as a gamer, as somebody that plays titles digitally, uh, there is no such thing as digital fucking scarcity. If Chris Roberts and team want to create a ship worth a thousand dollars and only sell like a couple hundred of them Yeah, they'll get sold out in minutes, but guess what? That doesn't have to be a limited time drop They're just going off the psychology of a lot of people who actually will look at these things with FOMO All right people who have the fear of missing out the need to want something a little bit scarce They're literally appealing to the whales in this situation now, this is where I have a serious problem with this game and, like, the absolute crap performance so far, even in the alpha. And I get it, it's an alpha. But this is an event week where they want to basically raise money. And from what I've understood, they've raised millions of dollars, because, of course, whales will buy ships and people will just chuck money at them.
that stuff. The thing about this is, had the game been more polished, they probably could have made a lot more. Now, it's interesting that for a game in alpha, they constantly run these events to try to get people to keep constantly funneling money into this project, uh, which honestly should pretty much stick to its roadmap and focus on not just releasing their single player component, but also fixing up the general feel of the multiplayer. The entire period of the Invictus launch week, I was marred with server issues, severe lag, uh, trying to get off of my primary res residence area 18. The spaceport computers did not work, so I couldn't even summon my actual ship, couldn't access the vehicle like repair menus had I wanted to, and thankfully the community is awesome. There was one player willing to fly us all out to a nearby space station so we could just summon our ships there. Well, I tried doing it, we almost got off the planet, and to be nice, I wanted to pay this guy some money for doing this for us in the first place. It was a nice gesture. Literally trying to transfer credits to another player caused me to have a crash, and again, this wasn't just one crash, every time I tried to get off this planet, for a goddamn hour, I was crashing over and over and over again. And this was recorded at like two in the morning, meaning that peak server time was nowhere close by. Again, this game has some severe issues. And instead of like, you know, fixing those, that, that core, instead of having a solid foundation, we're just focused on adding in gameplay elements piecemeal from time to time. Honestly, the entire progress and development of this game is a giant mess, okay? And I honestly, I can't even blame CIG. They're honestly doing way too much. A single player, a persistent universe, God knows what other projects as well too. And this game is parallel developed as well. So there's different modules being shuffled in from time to time. It is a goddamn mess. And of course, obviously, I want to also say that you don't have to buy every ship with money, from what I understand. You can go to a dealership, which is admittedly pretty cool, it's very immersive, and you can buy ships from there as well. One thing I wanted to add on top of the limited ships is, one of the examples CIG gives is uh, they want to have a ratio of ships, uh, you know, smaller ships to larger. So they want, obviously, not everyone should have a capital class ship on launch day. But to be honest, I don't really see this as sort of a logical point. Um, to be honest, I think most of it is down to the fact that if they have $2,000 ships, they can sell a bunch of them by claiming that they're limited releases and probably incentivize whales to dump more money at a quicker rate. It's not just Star Citizen that does this. I would argue Star Citizen's one of the games that laid the foundation. Tons of other games release limited time DLC, so they can incentivize people to just come in and throw their money. It is a wild, wild world of psychological work when it comes to getting whales to give away their cash. And Star Citizen, with how much money it's raised, seems to be the goddamn masterclass in it. But again, that's just my theory on it. Obviously, CIG wants to keep a certain ratio of capital class ships to standard ships. I personally don't really believe their reasoning. But then again, that's the entire, uh, that's, that, 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 that's just analyzing this game in general. Anyways, let's get back to the piece. So here's the other reality over here. You can buy other ships like the Polaris, for instance. The Polaris is a nimble Corvette class capital ship. And if you look into the buying options, it's $750. Now you might be like, whoa, at least if I pay $750, I can fly. Uh, uh, uh. The ship is in concept, meaning it hasn't actually been made. Yeah, Chris Roberts, Robert Space Industries has actually found a way to sell goddamn JPEGs to people just on the hope that one day they'll get to fly this ship. When will they fly it? I don't know. Maybe in a year, maybe in, maybe in a month, maybe 10 years, who fucking knows? But of course, at this moment in time, what you can say is they really focus on the lore. Believe it or not, buying a goddamn ship in this video game is like going out to an actual car dealership and reading through things like the brochure, getting a bit of the lore, understanding what your ship has, you know, getting the insurance on it, making the pledge. And as they develop these ships, they give you a loaner from what I understand, so you can play something similar until they finally develop the ship. It's kind of like if you pre-ordered the Cybertruck from Tesla, and instead of, you know, waiting for years until whenever that thing materializes, Tesla gives you a Model Y loaner in exchange until they release a Cybertruck. Obviously, this is the digital world. It doesn't cost RSI anything to give you a goddamn loaner when you're paying them $700 plus for a in-concept ship. Now, don't get me wrong, the ships are very impressive. In fact, every ship that they have in this game really is unique. There are ships that have 
one-man operations, and then there's entire luxury ships with beds, bars, drones, entire like multi-user like uh, user cockpits that you can go around in. You can rent some of these ships if you have enough money in the game. I actually played with some of my friends. One of my buddies, Tyler, actually did rent a ship that was really, really cool to look at. And then, of course, when you look at the price tag for said ship, you don't actually want to buy it because I don't want to make terrible goddamn financial decisions. But of course, at the end of the day, it's because of these luxury ships and it's because of these super expensive digital purchases that from the outside looking in, any normal person would go, what the fuck is going on here? It's because of these ships that RSI is able to fund themselves so heavily. And honestly, it really shows you that they don't really need to complete the game. They are making solid microtransaction money literally by creating these ships, some of them even in concepts, and just selling them to people and with the hopes that one day they'll get to fly them in the metaverse that is Star Citizen. Could you imagine if Rockstar Games, every other update for GTA Online, decided to create a brand new like sports car and actually go down the road of, you want this, you gotta pay us like $200, $300 to get access to the new Infernus model. That would be insane, but hey, that's kind of not far off the mark from what I see over here at Star Citizen. Again, people who look into this game from the outside can kind of look at the community as almost a cult. Uh, people suffering from Stockholm Syndrome at this point. And again, if it wasn't for the fact that the community is kind of awesome, uh, yeah, that's the impression any normal human being is going to develop. Even on Robert Space Industries, they literally give you what the ship pipeline is. So when it's in concept, artists and designers determine the concept look, 3D renders, functional design for a ship. It's not even the final thing. Then you've got the long-term production, which basically they have the development work planned and added to the roadmap. Then of course you've got active production, then it's hangar ready, so you can just watch it, and then once it's flight ready, you can take it to space. So this is exactly how ships get released. It's insane. You're pre-ordering for the concept of the ship, all right? It's like going to a car show and buying the concept car. You don't even know if they're gonna make it. Hell, you don't even know if it's actually a functional vehicle at that point. It's just a fucking pipe dream. You are paying for a JPEG pipe dream. Stop it, seek help. Now, the development of Star Citizen is no joke. If you actually look at the roadmap, they are very, very honest, giving you a very massive progress tracker that just shows you pretty much when these modules are made, when they're being developed, what's coming on with like the newest updates. So for instance, with 3.2, which is tentative for Q3 2023, they've got extra gameplay add-ons. For example, you can do ship trespass. You can do new missions like receive a consignment. Then of course, you've got the progress tracker for various other elements like gameplay story systems, lighting teams, you've got sandboxes, you've got AI content teams, so on and so forth. So obviously they do give you transparency, but the reality of the game development world with Star Citizen is it's such a modularly designed game that even when you look at different elements, like I do remember there was a moment where they switched from uh, CryEngine all the way to Amazon Lumberyard. Yeah, it seems like CryEngine, while it looked pretty, wasn't really perfect for rendering entire worlds or a goddamn universe. And so the entire development team switched to Amazon's Lumberyard, which was a fork of CryEngine, but it was actually back-ended with Amazon AWS and it allowed them to achieve the dreams that they wanted. Then there was the FPS module, which uh, again, I believe another team worked on it. And then of course, entirely, there were some issues with having that system work within the current Star Citizen system. Again, when you're designing your game in parallel, it can cause issues trying to fuse all of it into one piece, especially for a game that is as ambitious as Star Citizen is. Then of course, one of the interesting aspects was server meshing and persistent streaming, which is possible, and if they actually achieve this, they are making more money off of the technology they create than the actual game. Let me go over what this is. So at CitizenCon 2951, we took a deep dive into the transformative technologies of server meshing. 
Now, server meshing isn't new. There's plenty of games that do it. Some metaverse experiences allow you to have 50,000 people in one server because they mesh and combine servers together. But what Star Citizen wants to do is release persistent streaming in the first version of the replication layer. So what is the current state of server meshing tech? Most people when talking about server meshing usually think about the very final step of the technology where we put servers together. The truth is before the final step, there's a long chain of pre-requirements and fundamental technology changes. So object container streaming, okay? For server meshing to work, we first require technology that allowed us to dynamically bind unbind entities via the streaming system. As this isn't something the engine supported when we started. So we released client-side object container streaming. Once this initial stepping stone was out of the door, the technology that allows us to dynamically bind unbind entities on the client had to be enabled on the server as well. Then you've got entity authority and authority transfer, static and dynamic server meshes, so on and so forth. Now, from what I understand, the TLDR here is basically, they want you to have, for example, if you have this Coke can, right? I could throw this Coke can on one planet, right? Fly to another planet, and then do my business, take a piss, fly back to the other planet, maybe log off, you know, take a drink, and I should be able to find the same Coke can or the same item, or, 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 or again, just having persistence throughout the world. Now, again, I would argue that maybe this would be a bad use of resources, maybe this would be technically infeasible, and sometimes you don't really need to have the Coke can be always present on the server just for the sake of immersions. Okay, so the Coke can is a bit of an extreme example, a bit of an impractical example. Let me give you some practical ideas of why this technology would be amazing. So for a game that is an MMO, a persistent universe, having one server where you can see not, you know, tens or twenty ships, hundreds of ships, okay? When you're flying towards these big planets, you eventually want to see, like, every single player on that planet somewhat interact. You also want to have a system where, let's say some person's ship crashes in space. Uh, you want another player to be able to find that shipwreck and potentially salvage it or do something. We want to see history and records. Uh, of, of what has happened in the world. That is, I guess, the point of this technology. And if it is completed, not only would it be amazing from a networking perspective, from a technological perspective, but it would absolutely add an extreme layer of immersion and even like player world building if they were able to succeed here. The thing is, this is an incredibly tall order, and for CIG to accomplish this is almost next to impossible. So I, I, I hope the best, but you got to be realistic in these scenarios. Ladies and gentlemen, if this is possible, and it is, but for these guys to achieve this technology would be a massive undertaking. And to understand, if they pull it off, it's going to change the way we do MMOs and networks entirely. This is actually massive. And of course, it's a tall order, and given how Star Citizen's development has been going on, whether they achieve it is still honestly up in the air. Now, the way that Star, Citizens, Star Citizen works online is they're supposed to have like 100 star systems. So far in the alpha, there's only one, which is a Stanton system. And the thing is, whereas most online games typically uh, do instances, where if you play something like Destiny 2, there's a hub world that you can jump into, and you can interact with a bunch of players in a hub location. But if you ever actually want to do a mission, or like a raid, or a dungeon, then you team up with a few friends and you create an instance. An instance is where you basically connect with three, four, six, however many players, and there's nobody else that is jumping into that instance. Star Citizen doesn't operate that way. If you want to fly to another part of the Stanton system, you're sitting there and flying in the same space, the same instance as every other player, technically. Meaning that if I'm quantum traveling between one planet to another planet, I can stop and be part of the server and be an actual entity in deep space somewhere. And of course, the same could happen for any other player on the other side of this galaxy, so on and so forth. That's the world they want. And it's cool, it's interesting, but how feasible is it when you're including potentially 100 star, uh, 100 star systems? Now, ladies and gentlemen, at this moment in time, I want to talk about Squadron 42. Up until this point, all I've been talking about is the persistent universe mode, which arguably is the reason most people play Star Citizen. 
Uh, before we get into the gameplay, to describe the niche that Star Citizen is hitting, it's kind of like that, like, kind of Tarkov niche, where people jump in, they get loot, they they build up, you know, uh, resources until the next server wipe, and uh, it's really just centered around immersion and, uh, and whatnot. It's really kind of like Tarkov in space, it, without some of that insane, like, you know, firefight realism. That's kind of the best way that I can put it. But of course, if we actually look into the entire game over here, they Star Citizen had Squadron 42. Now, initially, these were supposed to be the same games. This is the single player component. And at this moment, you should be able to buy this individually. Or at least you could until a few days ago when apparently you can't even pledge to get this game anymore. You know why? Because if you go to the pledge page, it's apparently giving you uh, error 404. Yeah, it's actually Squadron 404 at this point, not even goddamn available. Yeah, Squadron 42, start the adventure. Uh, you'll experience unprecedented emotion and life with stunning, realistic characters and cutting edge performance by Mark Hamill, Gary Oldman, and Gillian Anderson. Yeah, I, I actually, as sad as it sounds, I'm pretty sure that Mark Hamill and Gary Oldman may not even make it until this game actually releases, as sad as that fucking sounds. Embark on a cinematic single-player adventure as a rookie Navy combat and pilot in the Star Citizen universe. Okay, all that bullshit aside, you want to know when the last update was? Get ready for this one. Watch the update, okay? This is apparently the latest goddamn update right over here. Squadron 42, bringing gameplay to life. This is five years ago, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, five years ago, April 26, 2018, was when we got the last update for the goddamn single player component. Now, in my opinion, Squadron 42 should have been out a, a, well over years ago. This should have been the one priority for Cloud Imperium games. And I get it, selling ships and JPEGs is a lot more profitable, but let me explain the long-term goal here, okay? If you want to get people invested in your universe, I think the easiest way, especially for a single, especially for a space game that's built off of the back and hype of Freelancer and Wing Commander, to add that single player component. You know, if you have Squadron 42, and yes, it is a universe, maybe it's not the whole universe, but you can explore, you know, you can do missions, you can do contracts like hunt NPCs, mine, uh, you know, trade resources, so on and so forth. If you can develop and understand the core gameplay loops for the MMO in a single player environment that is polished, which again, Star Citizen is effectively, as far as I'm understanding, Freelancer 2 or really what Chris Roberts's end goal is, then that would have been a great way to hook people in and then immediately when you're done with squadron 42 you could just jump into the persistent universe and start there i believe that's what the idea is but honestly it would have been amazing if we would have gotten more updates and a much more concrete vision and detail on the actual Squadron 42 system. In fact, the only thing with a, uh, the, the only time we ever got to see a vertical slice was years ago in regards to uh, Squadron 42. There might've been some more updates. Granted, I haven't been following it a lot since then, but this vertical slice is a great example as to like what they should have released. It had enough content, uh, at least seemingly to flesh out a single player experience for somebody. Granted, again, it wouldn't be all 100 star systems, but Again, to have a sandbox for you to explore, get the feel right and understand, and really get the lore down would have been a great, you know, a great springboard into jumping into the Persistent Universe. Again, the, the development of this game is so weird. Had they focused on these things, I feel like a lot of the criticism would have been taken away and people would have had something tangible to play while they wait for this server meshing Persistent Universe dream to eventually materialize. At least you get a game to truly understand what our citizen is all about as that develops. Now, from what I understand, this was supposed to come out 2018, 2019, but this is basically indefinitely delayed. At this moment in time, it almost feels like nobody wants to talk about Squadron 42. From time to time, I'll get emails from RSI like, hey guys, we got some updates for the single player. Yeah, where's the actual gameplay? Where are the missions? When it is? When is it releasing? If it releases at all. 
okay? Yes, this is the one feature that I wanted the whole time, and I'm sure a lot of other Star Citizen players also wanted this, okay? The ability for people to play some single player. If anything, if you logically think about it, this would have been great for people to just start off in. Having a single player that would allow you to understand the mechanics of the game, to get a feel for the universe, to embed yourself into the lore, would have been a very, very pivotal the key to get people hooked onto the persistent universe, the MMO side. Up until this point, the MMO is in a perpetual alpha state where, again, the game isn't the best functioning and the single player component is pretty much vaporware at this moment in time. The fact that they even allowed you to pay money to pledge for this when there was no update for years is downright criminal in my opinion. Now listen, at this moment in time, I've talked a lot of crap about CIG. If it's one thing about Cloud Imperium Games is Chris Roberts and the team behind this definitely have a perfectionist mentality. At this moment in time, Chris doesn't have anybody from corporate companies like Microsoft, EA, whatever, to basically come in and put some reins on him. Tell him, listen, buddy, okay? You might want to go and create some kart racing mini game for Star Citizen, but you gotta at least have the goddamn game made! No, at this moment in time, as long as people keep giving Star, uh, Star Citizen pledge money, they don't really have a reason to complete the project. They don't have a reason to complete the single player on time. They don't even have a reason to complete the MMO on time. For them, as long as they sell the dream of this being real life but in space, that's all that ever matters. And yeah, you could make an argument that as long as the core Star Citizen community is happy, then shouldn't we all be happy? Listen, at the end of the day, there are a lot of people like me that are just completely jaded from the entire situation. At this moment in time, I don't even care if Star Citizen comes out. Because at this point, I've seen other franchises come and create entire experiences, expansions, at this moment. Elite Dangerous pretty much got announced the same time as this. Elite, as a franchise, has been around forever. They've come out with their game, they've come out with expansion packs, they've even got bad press associated. No Man's Sky got announced, released, panned by the gaming community, then updated to an absolutely stellar space game. And of course, Star Citizen is just still sitting there with its dick in its hand and no end in sight. Now, of course, ladies and gentlemen, what is the game like? Ooh, Muda, let's talk about the game. So this is the second part of the video where I actually really want to talk about the game and why I do kind of like it. So let me explain something about Star Citizen. Star Citizen is a game that you can run on your computer and you need a pretty good computer to run Star Citizen. I have some of the most top of the line rig that you can buy. I have a good processor. I have a good GPU. I have a crap ton of fast RAM. And no matter what, waking up in the hub worlds for this game will always run at 30 to maybe 40 frames, 60 if I'm goddamn lucky. The, uh, you know, space flying, the planets themselves actually do run at a pretty decent frame rate. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. What is the experience like? Well, first you download Star Citizen, download around 100 gigabytes of game data, and then you start the game off. Now at this moment you can create a character and the character creation is actually very decent. Then of course, you pick where you wanna spawn in. Now you've got a few options. You've got Area 18, you've got Loreville, which is where I picked, and a few other hub areas. These hub locations are all very well done. There's multiple shops, there's multiple locations. There are entire transit systems that are in these locations to take you from your habitation all the way to the spaceport and beyond. Now when you wake up, I think this level of immersion is where it's at. Once you create your character, you wake up in a habitat, you get out of bed, and then of course you can bring up your mobile glass, which is sort of your, uh, you know, hub, your, your, uh, your PDA, your smartphone, if you will, which, allow you to, which allows you to view your standings, your contract, allows you to trade, so on and so forth. Now at this moment in time, you have a few options for what kind of missions you want to go in. You can choose delivery missions, you can choose bounty hunter missions, you can choose repair missions, you can choose security missions. There is a fair amount of gameplay loops to go down, which I like. If you want to be a delivery driver, you can do that. If you want to be somebody that fights AI all day, you can do that. If you want to do dog fights, you can do that. There is a gameplay loop for every type of player, which I really like. Now, of course, at this moment in time, you before you even pick a mission, you gotta take the elevator all the way to the ground floor from your habitation, find your way through the maps in the game, not in your mobile glass, no, 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 the maps that are visible uh, in the actual habitation. This game is very immersive. Once you figure out how to take the train, the, uh, the, the, the tram system or whatever, 
to uh, the spaceport, you then go all the way through, go through security, actually go to a module where you call up your ship in the hangar bay, you go to said hangar bay, get into your ship, which again, all ships are different, so you gotta figure out how to open it, get inside, get into the ship, get a flight ready, call up communications, call up the actual landing services, get clearance, and fly out into the ship. Now, of course, getting off of the planet is its own beauty. The game has some brilliant cloud technology that, again, I can't stress enough. It looks gorgeous. This game is a very pretty looking game. But once you get into the old space over there, you pick a mission, you fly through quantum space travel, and bam, you do a bunch of jobs. Now, initially, when you start off into the game, you will be doing a lot of boring, boring jobs. For me, I did a lot of delivery work because it allowed me to A, figure out how to fly the ship, take it off, land. It gave me my flight, my wings, so to speak. And honestly, I wasn't really comfortable shooting down planes yet. I really wasn't ready for that. And also the game's like FPS combat is either the AI you go up against is downright brain dead, or they have pin perfect precise aim through walls. So I wasn't ready for anything yet. I just wanted to get my bearing. So I did a lot of delivery missions. And uh, while I made some good money, I wanted to start doing other things. So I started to do some like, uh, you know, security work. So the game basically told me, go to this location, go down into this like bunker, kill 10 enemies. And generally I could loot them for some money and come back, store them onto my ship and sell them whenever I get back to a hub world. There were dog fights that I did, which were fun. There were searching assignments where I actually went to derelict stations, got out an EBA, literally floated around until I found whatever the game wanted me to do and so on and so forth. There were cave systems that I could go into and explore just so I could actually figure out uh, the mysteries and the lore behind some of these locations. Again, Star Citizen has a lot of stuff right now in Stanton for you to actually explore. If you wanted to just sit down and do these gameplay loops, which admittedly do sound boring on paper, but once you get immersed into how the game plays, this can be something that I will say is enjoyable. Obviously, if you put hundreds of hours into it, you're going to find a lot of repetition. Now, I want to just specify one of the loops was mining, which uh, from what I've heard is relatively profitable. This involved me going and buying an actual buggy, sticking it into my vehicle because yes, you can actually put smaller vehicles within larger vehicles, which admittedly is pretty cool. You know, I imagine the capital ships might be like the Pillar of Autumn at some point. But of course, uh, I took this ship, I flew it down to a rocky planet where I effectively drove my uh, Grey Cat ROC around, the uh, dune buggy, and effectively started mining for items. Which, again, you know, it's a boring task, but once I had enough, I could go to a hub station, sell it as a commodity, and uh, that is generally what I wanted to do in practice. My first few runs weren't that great because obviously uh, I didn't pilot well, and I actually crashed a full supplies worth into a station, which granted I tried to get this back by EVA flighting and trying to see if I could somehow drag uh, this uh, vehicle into my ship. Didn't work, lost everything. Normally in a game I would quit, but there's something about the immersiveness which I can come, I can somewhat appreciate, but also I can understand doing this for 30, 40 hours as a grind it requires the toughest of wills. Now, obviously this game is, like any game, fun with friends. And so I got to play with about three of my friends. Uh, I got to play with my friends Carson, Nick, and Tyler, and we had a great time flying around doing these missions with each other. But I think one of the coolest experiences in gaming was actually going to Microtech for the first time. Now, up until this point, I, the Stanton system wasn't entirely complete. There were planets that weren't there. Microtech is a planet that is far off in the northern side of the system, but it is arguably one of the most expansive hub worlds and also one of the most beautiful ones. I remember the absolute feeling of flying to this location with my friends, landing in the same place together, we were in the same ship, and then taking the tram and just looking into the horizon and seeing this massive city that we were flying into. There were so many shops and so many locations and so many things to see and buy that genuinely it was one of the best experiences that I've ever had with friends. Look, the only comparable experience to me here is something like GTA Online, where they have a very well-crafted city, uh, a lot of places that you can explore, a lot of places that you can even shop with, do these kind of metaverse-like things. Star Citizen, when it's 
it, when that happens is amazing. The ability for us to go onto the frigid colds of Microtech's exterior for five minutes before we froze to death was a fun time. Then the entire point of spending hundreds of thousands of credits that we literally spent hours mining. Yes, mining. Because when I wanted to make money, I literally bought an ATV, stuffed that into the cargo hold for my ship, flew it down to a planet, literally mined for an hour to make enough money to rent a luxury Robert Space Industries thousand dollar cruiser that we could fly around and just see the world in. That is an experience that I will never forget. And that's one of the points where Star Citizen shines. Now, even with all of that said, ladies and gentlemen, do I recommend this game? No, because ladies and gentlemen, as fun as that experience was, the game is still wholly incomplete. Yes, the game is an alpha. Of course it's supposed to be incomplete, Muda. The problem with Star Citizen is a game that is too ambitious. And it is really a game that obviously they've got the money to see it to completion. But with a team like RSI and Chris Roberts being the visionary that he is, I don't actually see an end goal in sight. This game really needs somebody to come in with a corporate mind and just actually start putting in goals and hitting those goals to begin with. You know, for a lot of us people who were finding these sandworms and all these cool little pieces of tech interesting at one moment in time, in the last few years, a lot of individuals that were once Star Citizen messiahs have pretty much given up on this game and have pretty much thrown it into obscurity. It is, at this moment in time, the perfect definition of the sunk cost fallacy. There are so many elements in this game that do not work perfectly, that are elements, even the inventory system is not perfect. There are elements in this game that will always appear to be placeholders. There are performance issues in the game that need to be addressed. There are entire segments of this game that completely lack any form of polish. There is no joke when every time you spawn in, the AI will literally be T-posing in front of you. There is never a moment in Star Citizen where the AI is not broken. Every single hub world that I go to, if I go to a counter, there is always gonna be one AI that is not loaded in perfectly. It is a game that is not perfect. It is a game where picking up items and interacting with them can be very, very finicky. You know, I wanted to make this video earlier for a while, but one of the updates for Star Citizen literally caused these servers to have some of the worst lag spikes imaginable. There was a moment where trying to open a door took five minutes in the game for the server to actually recognize my client's input and give me a response from the server. It was downright unplayable at one point. And of course, while things have changed for the better, this is a game that has no end in its development in sight. Ladies and gentlemen, for me to recommend Star Citizen, they have got to actually put out some tangible goals and start hitting them and hitting them and hitting them in stride. Ladies and gentlemen, Star Citizen is the perfect example of crowdfunding gone haywire. Ladies and gentlemen, will it one day be completed? Honestly, I think Grand Theft Auto 8 will be out before Star Citizen is complete. I'm not even being cute there. I genuinely do believe that. Ladies and gentlemen, Star Citizen is one of the most expensive games that I've seen developed, especially by a, by, by a developer that at one point was an indie developer. Now, I would argue, with the budget and size of their company, Cloud Imperium Games is about as AAA as any of the other studios that I have seen at this point. And the game that they are making is like quadruple A. This is the biggest game ever developed. This is the biggest, most ambitious concept ever pulled out. And it is one of those concepts that I think will always remain a concept and never a final production. Ladies and gentlemen, let me know what you think about this video in the comment section below. I wanted to do kind of a personal deep dive into one of the most interesting games for me, a game that I genuinely, genuinely was waiting for. If anything, Star Citizen is the game of my dreams but I don't think my dreams will ever become true. Ladies and gentlemen, let me know if you think differently. This is me, Mudahar, and if you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike if you dislike it, I am out.